Hey everyone, I'm Rob with MMORPG.com. Tonight I have with me Star Long from Portalarium. Evening, Star. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to come answer some questions about Shroud of the Avatar for us. Glad to be here. Right, so recently you just joined the team, I guess, actually within the, within the last two weeks. That's correct. Uh, uh, over the July 6th weekend uh, was when... I uh, started working with the team. Was that something you guys had planned beforehand, or was that something just kind of last minute? Richard's like, hey, I need your help, Star. Come, we need you down here in Texas. Come join us. Uh, you know, Richard and I have worked together uh, for the last 20 years, except for uh, the last few years where I've been at Disney. So we talk, uh, you know, fairly often. And, you know, we had talked about the project he was starting, and, you know, at, I was still at Disney at the time, um, but then when I, you know, decided to leave there, I, we started talking in earnest, and I think probably back in March, right around GDC, was where we really started talking seriously about working together again, and we, you know, we went out to dinner, and we just had this, we just started talking like we do, and just started ripping on each other's ideas and realized, you know, we, we really should get back together, get the band back together, and uh, work on a project together. And so it was really more about just our excitement at being able to work together again, mm -hmm. less about, oh my God, we need, you know, you know, we need your help. I mean, they had already done their Kickstarter, you know, they were, well, they were launching it then. And then, you know, we kind of had been talking off and on, you know, it was about, you know, from March to June or so of us saying, well, how would this work? And what would, what, you know, what would my role be, et cetera. But um, it was, it was kind of a foregone conclusion as soon as, you know, we had that sort of fateful dinner at GDC. Okay, so for people that, and I don't think I said, for people that don't know, you are the executive producer on the project, correct? That's right. So what is what do you, as the executive producer, actually do in day-to-day -day operations on Shroud of the Avatar? Well, one of the things I'm most excited about on this team is it's a really small team. I mean, we are, you know, fluctuate between 12 and maybe 18 people at the most, which is which is kind of back to our roots, like that's, you know, that's about the size of the team that Ultima Online was at, you know, for most of the project, except for sort of the last push. And uh, so that means I actually wear a lot of hats. Like I'm very heavily involved in the game design. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be managing budgets and schedules. Uh, so project management, but also a lot of creative. So a lot of it is, um, you know, design sessions where we go through a system and we say, okay, today we're going to have a session on combat or today we're going to have a session on abilities and we just hash through what that system is going to work like. Uh, then we talk about, well, what's a timeline to get a version up and running because we're, we're, we try really hard to get versions of whatever system we're talking about up and running as quickly as we can so we can sort of test our assumptions and say, wow, is this fun or not? And, you know, because we... We, we think we're really smart and we think we're clever, but it, it, and so we actually get our hands on it. And more importantly, when we get to have the players get their hands on it, that's when we sort of test our assumptions. Okay. One of the earlier questions for people that haven't read it, we had an interview with Star on print last week. Uh, you talked about something that you like to do is get a core vision early and iterate upon that. So they kind of had maybe part of the vision already done before you joined the team. How, how do you then take that and shape it with the way that you think the game should go from here? Well, you know, uh, one of the ways that Richard and I complement each other very well is, you know, Richard, Richard has this long, illustrious career creating single-player, really rich tapestries of, of role-playing games, these really deep worlds. Uh, and where when I... You know, he and I worked together on Ultima Online. You know, I, I was really the one pushing for, let's do this multiplayer, let's do this online. You know, uh, there's the, the snarky little quote, we, we, you know, which I think is mostly apocryphal, but, you know, of us going to EA and saying, we think this Internet thing is going to be big. <laughs> and uh, we, so I think where I'm going to be pushing for is, how are, how are we building the social system? How is the multiplayer going to work? How, are, how, are, how is the economy going to work? How are how intertwined is crafting going to be in the experience? Uh, because I, I feel really strongly about the player economy and, and, and you know, um, uh, 
how how that's inter how we want to make things the players make really matter mm-hmm. in the game and not just oh I'm gonna go bash this monster to get the great thing. Well, why couldn't the player make that great item? That was actually my next question. Uh, I wanted to talk about the crafting system because it's that we're I'm playing the video side by side with us and that's actually where they're at. The guys making a, I think he's making some dowels so they can put together yeah. a, a chair. So we saw that, you know, he can make himself a pretty nice chair. And if he Very wants to, chair making. I know, and if he wants to build a bar, he's right in there. But exactly. uh, <laughs> other than making furniture, what what do you expect that we're going to see the players be able to craft, and how is that going to actually impact, you know, the game? Well, I really believe strongly that players should be able to make as good, and if not better, weapons and armor than you can find off killing monsters or bosses. Hey, and somebody made that armor or weapons that dropped off the boss, right? Yeah, and so what we're trying to do is, like, the game mostly, for, with a few exceptions, like, there's some, there's some plot, el- plot characters who will drop specific items and things like that, but for the most part, the game will what we're trying to design is the game will only generate sort of generic items like a sword and a piece of armor and all of the like truly unique things and the uh, things with magical properties will be player crafted. And, and when players, I mean the most direct route for players to get access to those items that other players make is to trade them with each other or buy them off each other's vendors in their, in their shops. But, but in addition, if you, what, we're, what we want to do is if you sell one of the items you made, and every item is going to have your maker's mark on it, so people will be able to see, oh, Star made this sword. That will then go into the pool of items that in, in what, you know, on the back end we call our loot tables, which are the, the sort of spreadsheets that say, oh, if you kill this thing, that's what this thing will drop. We'll put those items in the inventories of the characters and the creatures that you're fighting, so when you kill that lich, well, the axe that you find on the lich, there's a really good chance that that was made by a plate. <laughs> it's actually pretty interesting. I yeah. think that'll be a first. Yeah, we, 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 we think that we think it'll be, it could be interesting. I mean, again, this is one of those assumptions that we want to get up and running quickly. We mm-hmm. want to test. So we, we, it sounds really clever, uh, and we'll see how it plays out. All right, great. So in addition to that, one of the things that's kind of new um, well, it's not new. It's a new take on an old system. Is the quest dialogue, and instead of just having like underlined hot words that you repeat back to the person talking to you, you actually seem to have like a free form conversation with them. And I guess there's going to be some trigger words there that you don't necessarily know that's going to get that guy to start talking to you. Yeah, we wanted the conversation system to feel like you were talking to a, a person, and not and not just moving through what's obviously very a, a tree of dialogue. And so the, and what we hope to have is we hope to have that each character that you talk to has a large enough set of things that they can talk about that you can really kind of go up to them and start chatting. And depending on the way the conversation goes determines how they lead you to the plot or adventure element. And so, and, and we hope that you can, get there in a variety of ways. So in the demo we showed, the way you got to find out about this dungeon was actually talking about chairs with the bartender who then mentions, oh, there's this, there's, I've heard about this crazy chair, this throne of bone in the dungeon. And so th- th- that was an example that we wanted to show, you know, a- about as part of the exciting chair making, uh, w- about how, you can have these conversations with these characters and they can be about seemingly unrelated things that will then lead you to a plot element. And, and again, that's how it would happen in reality. You wouldn't be picking from a menu of items in front of a person. So I totally understand. Now I got another question that goes on with that. Is there any sort of things that in the single player portion, I guess, not really the single portion, but the main story, quest that things would happen dynamically and that, you know, maybe I talk to the bartender one day and he doesn't say anything, but then the next day, say a band of, like, orcs are wandering past the town. He's like, hey, you know, we're low on 
beer today or mead because these orcs are outside and they're causing us problems and we can't get caravans through. Yeah, the conversations will be attached to our system of flags. So depending on what the game state is, uh, the, the characters will react to that and, and update their dialogue. Okay, but that dungeon in particular that we did see, is that kind of like a... It may have just been a stage for the video, but if not, is that like a static event that we're always going to eventually be able to walk up to the guy and say, hey, I got some chairs. You go, oh, I got this chair in this crazy dungeon over here. Well, everything we, we showed in the demo was us exercising game systems mm -hmm. and, and tech and, like, you know, seeing where we could push uh, parts of what we were trying to do. Uh, it really, uh, we didn't show anything that was part of the plot or the main the main map or anything over land. And in fact, um, we're, we're, because we've got some interesting twists in the plot, we're going to hold a lot of the main map where the story unfolds and where players will spend most of their time. We're going to hold that pretty close to our best till close, but we're, we're, we're building, a, you know, an area that includes things like the, the dungeon we showed and that town we showed that, that we're going to hope to put in players' hands, uh, sometime soon and uh that, so so that that dungeon was an example dungeon not necessarily one that would appear in the final understood one of the things that you guys also highlighted not too long after that during the combat was the fact that you have a very mini minimalist ui uh mm -hmm. to increase the immersion is there going to be anything else that we see you know is it going to be you're you're having to learn all your commands because you're not going to see notifications from on screen how, how is that going to work and play into, you know, combat and different things like that? Uh, that's a great question. You know, for the UI right now, we're just operating kind of on the uh, philosophy mm -hmm. of minimalism. And we don't have a lot of those, frankly, we don't have a lot of those answers yet of, like, how, how exactly am I going to know how I'm doing in combat? I mean, the, the goal, though, is we're trying to get away from lots of numbers, lots of bars, lots of, you know, and, and getting away from this sort of spreadsheet shortcut management that a lot of, uh, that we've devolved to, in, I think, and, and trying to get you more immersed in it. So I, I think that showing things like, oh, wow, this creature, you know, stopped using its left arm. That must mean I must have done some damage to it. It's, it's you know, or it's, or it's moving, you know, it's swinging slower. Trying to give visual clues as to the state of your opponent's based on the actual state of the, the creature that you're fighting, like how they're moving, how they're acting, um, the, their weapon choices, things like that. Well, a lot of MMOs nowadays, you're playing the UI and not the game. The UI becomes the game, especially with all the modders and you know, third-party add-ons and things. You're, you're playing the UI and there's like a game running in the background. Yeah, it, it, it's become you know, shortcut bar management. Uh, and I think that's a great Kickstarter idea. Someone should just make a game that's just about, you know, shortcut bars. <laughs> you don't need any pictures. No, you're right. It, it would it would be pretty cheap because you'd save all the money on all the art, and Lord knows that's where a lot of the money goes these days. So, yeah, right. hmm, hold on, let me write this down. I might. Anyway, all right. Speaking of art, and uh, let's talk a little about the game world. Just something that might have just came across the video not so long ago, uh, the Tesla coils. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's another fantasy game. Well, yes, and it's medieval fantasy, but now we've got Tesla coils. What's going on there? Well, here's, here's the theory, and uh, actually I think this will be a bit of a reveal for you guys. Um, the, because if you look at how the Ultima series worked, the story was always that you, a person from Earth, is being transported to this mythical place. So you always, the idea was that you always played yourself, and you were an otherworlder, uh, as the characters would call you. And, and, and the Avatar. Yeah, and we're carrying that same fiction forward into this game, where you, it's really you who's going to this place. And so you're from another, you're from our modern world, and being plunged into this medieval setting, medieval fantasy setting, and so you're, the idea is that, and you're one of uh, many of visitors from Earth coming to, the, coming to this place, and so the idea is that 
you would try and recreate some of the technology that you have from the modern world, but you're not going to have, I mean, they're not going to have integrated circuits. They're not going to have, you know, electricity as we know it. So that it, that's our, that's our, so it's not necessarily steampunk per se, because it's more about this idea that, well, if people from a modern era got tra traveled through time into a, that they would try and recreate some of the technology. <laughs> All right, awesome. That actually kind of teed right into the next thing I was going to talk to you. I asked you about crafting earlier, but we didn't really talk about the economy. Now I wanted to try and get into the economy, but at the same time, hopefully address the fact that the game is able to be played in the single player mode, and then there's like the multiplayer mode. How do you stop people doing things in the single player mode that could affect the multiplayer mode, especially that could have a negative impact on the economy when you want players to be creating a lot of different items? That's a great question um, that is going to take a lot of hard work to solve. <laughs> that's, the, that's the sort of uh, um, cagey answer that I'll give. We, we, we talk a lot about that. Um, that is, it's one of our largest challenges, but we really want to be able to achieve it. And so a lot of any player, to, so while you can play the single player mode, any transactions between players have to be validated through our servers. So we hope to catch a lot of those things that would disrupt because of that. So that's that's one of the ways we will hopefully handle it. <laughs> All right. Um, what if, I'm sorry. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Something in the chat room distracted me. Um, as far as people creating their own items. So what do you want to do to help enable them to have this in-game economy? And let's just kind of ignore the single-player aspect for a minute so we don't get stuck in the mud about how we're going to keep people from pulling things out of the single-player game into the multiplayer game. What do you... We talked about... Actually, we haven't in this interview. In the past, I talked to Richard about there's going to be different prime real estate and you know different places you want to set up your shops. Uh, how is that evolution going in the game right now? And you know what different things have you seen in the economy or what different things you plan to help, you know, nurture and get that economy going? Uh, again, another great question. We, so a, as Richard's mentioned before, you know, we, we really felt like the way we did housing in Ultima Online, while it had a lot of challenges associated, it was also really compelling, this idea that your, your real estate was in the shared space. It was an instant out it was and there was a finite amount of it just like in the real world and so that and that's how we're going to be handling real estate in the game as well is that there's a, a in each episode that we launch there will be a finite amount of real estate and so we do imagine that there'll be a bit of a land rush um, you know that's one of the benefits of being an early backer is that you know we're, we're you, you you'll get access before uh, others and so, but, and players will be able to share houses. So even though there's a finite amount, like, if, you know, you and your friend can operate a shop together. And so we, we you know, so that we think being able to own your own space that's in the contiguous wor world, so everyone sees your shop on the street uh, versus having to go to an instance, we think that's going to drive a lot of, you know, um, what, what we sometimes call collisions. Uh, collisions are where people will, you know, either intersect with each other or intersect with things that you've made, like the item, like the, like I was describing earlier with the crafts and items, or intersect with your shop that they would pass on the street while they were going to do something else. And so we think that'll facilitate that. The the way the the importance of crafting and the fact that players will make the best stuff in the game, we think that's going to be a huge thing. And and one thing that's important to note between, about the single player and multiplayer. Um, they're the same world. It's just whether you choose to see other people and interact with them or not. So, you know, I, I think that's a, I mean, I think, I know that's a subtle difference in how you describe it, but it, it, it's not that there's literally another single player world. There's one world that you can play through without, if you so choose, without seeing anyone else, or you can play in that same world and see other people. But it's all the same world. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, 
we just got off your web page before we started the interview, and you guys are sitting at a total of 2.34 million in crowdfunding now. Congratulations on that number, by the way. Thank but you. what it also means is you're rapidly approaching the stretch goal of 2.5 million. Yeah. How are you looking forward to, or I should say, how excited are you to looking forward to uh, working? with the Oculus Rift and making the game compatible for that? Uh, we were actually, there, it's fun, there was just a thread about that. So uh, I got to play with one for the first time at GDC and uh, I, I'm super excited about it. You know, we, uh, I was actually in QA and I'm, I don't remember the brand name of it, but uh, Harvey Smith and I were in QA together back at, uh, when we first started our career. So Harvey, Harvey uh, just did Dishonored last you know, year and uh, you know, our good friends and he really is a big believer in VR, and I remember that he pushed for us to do an update uh, um, uh, to System Shock uh, to to support one of the early, very early VR headsets. And so, ever since then, we've been, you know, you know, all of us, me and Richard and Harvey, have been interested in where where we can go with that. And so, the Oculus is, you know, one of the best implementations I've seen so far. And so we're we're pretty excited by it. I mean, it's still, you know, it's not yet where we idealize where we want VR to go, but it's really, it's getting there. And What, and, what did you play? Uh, I played Hawken. Oh, that'd be a good one to play. But, yeah, it was, it was awesome. I was like, a flying mech in the city was yeah. a pretty cool example of Eve, uh, Eve VR. If you get a chance to sit down with those the guys from CCP... It's, yeah. it's did an amazing job. Mind blown at E3. Cool. But <laughs> back on the shot of the avatar, though. Um, so you're the executive producer and essentially the project manager. Uh, one of the stretch goals that you guys did obtain and hit was that Tracy Hickman is supposed to be writing a prequel of sorts to set up the backstory for Shroud of the Avatar. When can we expect that? Uh, well... That's a great question, and I don't have an answer for it. We, um, I know there is a ton of material that he's generated already. Uh, you know, it's it, it's really it's really awesome working with Tracy. You know, we we'll get to a point where we're like, hey, we you know we need to build this town or we need to build this creature or things like that, and and we'll say, hey, Tracy, have you thought about that thing yet? And then we'll just get inundated with this pile of material, which is which is one of the reasons why Richard and Tracy work so well together because they both are firm believers in building this large amount of lore surrounding the experience we're creating, whether that experience that happens to be a book or a game. And, and because players and, and readers, in the case of books, only experience this sort of very narrow slice of the world, you know, in a novel or in a game. But there's a much larger world. And, and Tolkien kind of was the, the pioneer of this idea where, like, he had just all these maps and notes and a language and all these things that... you. You know, the Lord of the Rings, you only see this very thin slice of that much larger world, and Tracy and Richard do the same kind of thing. So um, I'm not sure when the novel's going to come out. Uh, it's, it'll definitely come out. We're, the goal is for it to coincide with the release of the game, so, uh, or before, right before the release of the game, so it'll be sometime next year. All right. Uh, you know, you've been at this game for, like, not this game in particular, but the, <laughs> the video game making game for over two decades now. And we all say that we learn from our successes, but personally I think that we kind of can learn from our failures more and, you know, what to do better next time. That being yeah. said, what's something that you may have not have done in the past as well as you would have hoped to that you're going to try and do better with on Shroud of the Avatar? Wow, that's a really, really, uh, really probing question. Um, and I agree, actually. I think I think learning from failure is as much, if not more, important than learning from success. And that I think some of the best leaders that I've ever worked with are the ones that one can acknowledge failure and 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 but not just acknowledge it, like like work through what are we going to learn from that. And I I think I mean there's some really obvious ones for me, which is you know don't shift too early. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, make sure that you manage scope carefully. Um, make sure that you're prioritizing what's the most important part of the experience. Um, and make sure that there's some longevity in the systems that you're building, that, that they aren't just 
wow, it's cool to, you know, do this one little, you know, fight these things, but what do I do after I'm finished fighting the monsters? And, uh, you know, I think that's where I've had some great success in the past and, you know, some places <clears throat> where it didn't work out so well. Last thing before I let you go, um, are you still on track for early alpha access for early words in December? Or are we still looking at that milestone? Um, <laughs> another great probing question. We definitely, we definitely are planning and we think we are well on track to have a version of the game playable for backers by the end of the year. And, you know, that was my highest priority coming on board is building out the timeline, working backwards from that date, decide, you know, figuring out what exactly is that, that playable version going to be, what, uh, what's going to be in it, um, where the player is going to go. And so that's a lot of things like, you know, that we've been working out in my first few weeks on the job. And so uh, I feel pretty confident, you know, I, I think, you know, it's a combination of using off the shelf technology, you know, Unity is just an amazing platform. Uh, the fact that we're crowdsourcing some of the content that's helping, um, the fact that we can just buy some of the content and modify it, that's, that's helping a lot. Um, you know, we, we're all, you know, the team is, a, a lot of us have been doing this a long time, so we, we, we know some of the classic mistakes, so we'll make some new ones. And uh, so I, I feel good. I feel confident. I mean, I think we're, we're and again, we're pretty small, so that means we can be pretty agile and, and, and adapt as we go. And we, we don't have a lot of inertia to overcome that we get for large teams or large companies. So I, I think we're in good shape for that. All right. Well, I appreciate you spending some time with us. I told you about a half hour. That's right where we're at right now. So Great. I'll let you go. Uh, everybody out in the chat room, you'll be able to see this interview tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And make sure to keep tuned to MMORPG.com for all the latest news and information on Shroud of the Avatar. Thanks, Stark.